Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are located today. My name is Lindsay Villasina, and I am with Scrum.org. I am here today with the Scrum Pulse, the illusion of alignment. And today with us, we have professional Scrum trainer, David Spinks, and we have Patricia Kong from Scrum.org. So welcome. And just a few quick guidelines before we get started. Your microphone will be muted throughout the session. However, we highly encourage you to ask your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to use the chat and I will help you the best that I can throughout the session, but please keep any content related questions in the Q&A so that we capture those and we can address any questions we don't get to after the session. So next slide, please. So very quickly, who Scrum.org is, we are the home of Scrum. We were founded by Ken Schwaber in 2009. Our mission is to help people and teams solve complex problems. We offer training and certification in professional Scrum. Our newest course that we recently launched is the Professional Scrum Facilitation Skills Training Class. And this content kind of feeds into that content. And we have Patricia and David here who were who played a role in creating the content for that course. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to David to introduce himself and then Patricia as well. Thank you, Lindsay. So my name is David Spinks. Uh, my background is in software development. I was a software developer for about 10 years um, before I got into Scrum and Agile. That was around about 2010. So since then, I've uh, been a Scrum master. Um, I've uh, been product owner for some teams um, and working as an agile coach. I became a professional scrum trainer with scrum.org uh, back in 2019. Uh, I'm also an accredited Kanban trainer with Kanban University as well. So I like to think, um, I think about lots of different flavors of uh, enabling agility as well. So scrum, Kanban, obviously with my experience as a developer as well, I've got some experience of XP practices, um, for example. Uh, the company that I work through is uh, called Red Tangerine. I co-founded that uh, with a partner of mine, Claudia Califano. Uh, so the two of us run that uh, company and that's uh, through uh, how we offer our services, training and consulting in the agile space. Uh, I'm also uh, the co-author of the books Adopting Agile Across Borders and a book that is just coming out uh, is already out depending on which part of the world you're in called Mastering Collaboration in a Product Team. Um, so uh, when I get some spare time uh, I uh, also uh, write as well. Um, so that's a little bit about me. All right, David. Um, so my name is Patricia Kong. As Lindsay mentioned, I um, work at Scrum.org. I've been at Scrum.org for um, almost 11, no, over 11 years. Um, and while I've been there, what I've been focused on and what I'm thinking about generally is agility at the enterprise level. And um, right now, really thinking about, great, we have the enterprise, how can we help the people inside individually and together improve um, rather than just focusing on turning that trip, so the, the ship. Um, I'm the co-author of the Nexus Framework for Scaling Scrum. Um, I co-developed the evidence-based management framework. So how do we know that agility is working for us? How do we actually use inspection and adaptation when we think about empiricism um, in an organization? I'm a youth mentor. Uh, my background is actually in finance, but it started through organizational behavior. And like most people with their backs against the wall at a startup, um, I came over into learning Agile and Scrum. So I am Boston in the US uh, based. I used to live in Europe and I am back here. I'm actually in the office. Um, the Scrum framework was actually created, I think downstairs from, from where we are I'm in our offices now. So that's just a little bit about me. And today about this webinar, um, this is about the illusion of alignment and um, how Scrum teams can make decisions stick. So we know how Scrum teams can make decision, but the big thing is about how do we make sure that everybody's in alignment when we're making those, those decisions. So what would that looks like when we think about it? And especially, I think this is, this is a little bit of the crux of facilitation for me, is that when we have a group of people that seem like they've agreed to something, and then what happens is we go through the motions and later, it seems like there's a lack of agreement, a lack of alignment, lots of misunderstandings that's where that tension happens. And facilitation is a great way 
to work through that and to expose some of that so that we can move through those difficult aspects. Um, and it's really something that's important for scrum teams, agile teams to be aware of because by its very nature, what we're doing when we're, we have a scrum team coming together is we have a lot of smart individuals, creative individuals who are trying to solve complex problems. And so what we're looking for are those different ideas and we can have that, that's great. We have all these different ideas of how to solve a problem, um, but what happens when we have to make those decisions and especially tough decisions when we're saying no to things. Um, so this is something that we really wanna explore. It's very common in Scrum Team, it's common in a lot of different teams. Um, and what we're trying to do here is introduce a model that might be helpful for you um, to address some of that, that misalignment and think about that risk um, when we're thinking about facilitation. A lot of the inspiration that we have, a lot of the material that we're gonna be presenting today with David is uh, based on this book, it's by Sam Kainer, uh, which is called The Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision-Making. Um, from that, there's, there's some different models that we can go through, but this is a great book if you're interested in um, moving further. So the illusion of alignment, um, what this image shows is when we think of a, a team and we're going through a decision that has to be made. This can be anything from sort of planning, this could be anything like refinement. We're, we're talking about something that we're trying to address. And what we have to do is make this decision together as a unit. And we're trying to work through and we think that every stage we're all aligned and at the end we can make a decision because everybody has been aware of what we're doing. So this could be something as simple as, hey, um, we're trying to go into spring planning. We're talking about the spring goal. Everybody's aligned. We've come through refinement. We've we're aware of what's gonna be happening next. We're aware of the product goal. We're thinking about this sprint goal. Come the day when sprint planning here, nobody agrees. What is that? And that is what this looks like because everybody has been thinking about things a little bit differently. So it's reality. This is reality when we think about what's going on in scrum teams that I've seen and scrum teams that I'm on. This is the reality in my household. And we should really be aware of that because it's not just, a, B, C, D, moving down. So one of the things is that, like I said, we have a smart group of people who are coming together and um, the reality is, is that we have different tangents when we're thinking. So even David and I, when we were working together on, on the course, we have different ideas of how, how things are gonna happen and we have to be aware of that. We're talking through these things. So the other thing is, is that we have to acknowledge that a lot of these tangents and how to solve this is a really big thing to think about because people get attached to their ideas. And when we get attached to idea, our ideas, what happens is sometimes we're not really listening or open to other options. So we're going one way because we're not able to really hear what's happening around us. And that's something that with facilitation, we can work through. So there's a lot of confusion, a lot of impatience that happens when we're not when we're not here. And then there's also this: we're in a team, the desire for everyone to be involved. So this is a really complex thing. How would we manage that and um, have a decision about that? So when we don't address those things, what we have is people who are kind of nodding, people who are glazing over, people who are agreeing. Um, and there's a lot of tension that comes up. So David, what I'm wondering is with some of your teams, have you seen a little bit of this happen? And what's the result of that? Yeah, unfortunately it happens more than I want to. Um, and again, maybe when I was less experienced, I've kind of suffered from facilitating some of these um, meetings or sessions perhaps in a way that didn't re really help um an example that i've seen a lot is um sprint retrospective actions so for example we'll get to the end of the retrospective there'll be some options for some actions and the team kind of say yeah yeah we'll we'll, we'll pick these these are one or two actions that we're going to take into the next sprint uh, it could be the team has decided we're going to give TDD a try. We're going to go into the next sprint and we're going to try a test-driven uh, uh, development approach. 
or maybe they're going to agree we're going to spend more time breaking product backward items into tasks so that we've got better transparency of what's going on and then you kind of get into the next sprints and it doesn't really happen and what why what happened we just agreed that in the sprint retrospective um what was missing and again then if i'm the scrum master i then feel like i have to then step in and sort of ask the team the question well what did we talk about in the retrospective why why are we not giving this a try um so that, that's one I, that's that's one example that i see a lot of actions from retrospectives um another example is um the, the sprint goal uh, so coming out of sprint planning with um, a, a sprint goal that the whole scrum team has apparently kind of agreed that this is this is what we're going to focus on for the sprint, and we might be a few days into the sprint, uh, and maybe at the daily scrum, or uh, I don't know, just having a conversation between two teammates, and we find that maybe there's some work that is questionable whether it's actually part of the sprint goal or not. So uh, maybe the question gets asked. Um, is this contributing to the sprint goal? Can we remember what the sprint goal is? And um, sometimes uh, I've seen where scrum teams actually they've lost focus on what their sprint goal. They can't even remember what it was because perhaps, um, again, like you say, they were just nodding and going along with it because um, they hadn't really bought into it as part of that um, um, during the sprint planning event. And that's a painful one that I've experienced where it's just we're, we're, we're really excited about this initiative. We're looking at this sprint goal. It makes super sense because of the product goal that we have and everyone's excited and then we come in you know day two day three in the sprint and oh i want to work on this thing down the product back line um and so that's that's something that's really painful and it's, it's something that's common that happens um i think in our world so uh let's talk about what we should be doing then to fix that yeah um so i think as well as uh, fixing it, we've got to acknowledge actually why, why it causes such a big problem. We, we've kind of got this illusion of alignment that you say it looks like a decision has been made, um, but people aren't fully committed to it. We're not maybe not committed fully to the sprint goal, for example, or maybe we're not committed to um, an improvement action from the retrospective. Um, Basically, where we get to is team members start to feel apathy for what's actually going on. Um, why, why are we even following the Scrum framework? Why, why even bother creating a sprint goal if we're not going to be really focused on it? This could even go as far as starting to question the Scrum events themselves. Why even have the retrospective if, um, if the actions that come out of it aren't really going to be actioned? So as well as demotivation, the danger is that we get apathy towards what we're doing and we just turn back into a group of people that are just doing tasks. They're just doing what they're told to do. Um, so how do we get through this? How do we, how, do we, how do we kind of solve this problem? Well, I think the first thing to acknowledge is we got to understand how we think as humans. Um, so there's maybe some psychology, some sociology that comes into this. Um, I don't know about you, Patricia, but I'm I'm someone that doesn't like conflict, and I think that's that's quite common, right? I think a lot of us like to avoid conflict and avoid having difficult conversations, and that could be what's going on here. So we tend to, as human beings to want to shut things down if conversations start to get difficult. Um, but when we're doing Scrum, when we're doing any sort of um, dealing with uh, solving complex problems, we have to have these difficult conversations all the time because we're dealing with complexity. That's what Scrum is designed for, right? So when we're dealing with the sorts of problems that we're employing Scrum for, it, it's, it's, it's unlikely that there's going to be easy answers. We need to tap into our creativity in order to solve them. However, again, this comes into the human psychology part. As human beings, we struggle with things that are unfamiliar to us. We, we like the established norms. Um, anything that's different from normality, anything that's going to be challenging, can be perceived as a threat. And we tend to judge things uh, negatively. So if we've got a particular difficult or complex problem that we're trying to solve and we're trying to think creatively as a group, we're going to be, you know, we're going to have to be creative in how we solve that problem. Well, okay, some of those creative suggestions might be met with negativity, with resistance. Other members of the team might look at the suggestions and think, well, that won't work. Uh, that's too risky. This is a stupid idea. Why are we even talking about this? We're, we're wasting our time. Um, 
let, let's go let's let's go and find the the, the first obvious solution uh, that came into our heads so the problem with this though is in that group setting people start to get annoyed they feel like their suggestions are not being taken seriously or maybe they're not being uh, understood. Maybe I've got this great idea to solve the problem, but the rest of my teammates just aren't really seeing what I'm seeing, for example. They're trying to shut me down. How will I behave? I'm gonna feel like I'm being misunderstood and I'm gonna start to disengage. I'm gonna think, well, maybe I'm just wasting my time. I'm just gonna go along with things um, and just, just do whatever the rest of the team want to do. Um, and this is where good facilitation can come in and where maybe not so good facilitation can actually make the problem worse. So and I, I've made this mistake myself um, when I've been uh, facilitating sessions with teams. We want to we want to we want to we want to alleviate the frustration that the team is feeling. So we try and we just want to get the groups to make a decision. And it might feel like we're helping, but we might actually be shutting people down shutting things down by saying right let's just agree on this this option and we might just ask an open question does everybody agree and people kind of nod and go along with it um, but we haven't really enabled everybody to understand the option fully we haven't allowed everybody to have a say on the different options and most of all people are, haven't really fully understood the reason behind the decision being made so this is what we need to uh, get past I was going to say the, the thing that you said earlier about the, the conflict um, and how that works in relationships, it's very relevant because one of the <clears throat> one of the signs that will perpetuate unhealthy behavior um, and the ability to, to the inability to work together is that we, we shut down. And when we're afraid of conflict or we don't want to address it or a facilitator thinks it's best if we don't have conflict. Let's just move away from that and we're not heard. It really shuts people down in the future to be able to um, have more collaborative engagement. Yeah. And we have a question that came in that somewhat relates to all of this. How do you handle group decisions when the group is silent and non participative? That's a great question. Um, it's tricky. And I think as a facilitator, we need to have an appreciation for lots of different facilitation techniques, um, different techniques that allow people to contribute in a way that um, might make them more comfortable. Um, for example, again, we've got to think of the human aspect here. You're going to have some people that are extroverts, uh, some others that are more introverted. Um, some people like to just uh, have a few moments to uh, think and gather their thoughts. So um, if I'm presented with a group that's uh, in that situation where you know, the group is silent, maybe I'm going to use a technique like, I don't know, one, two, four, all, and get people to kind of look at a question or uh, as individuals first and then discuss in pairs uh, and then move into fours. So again, it's about understanding lots of different types of facilitation techniques that give people the, time, the, the space to think, to put their own ideas forward, um, and whether that's in group settings or, again, moving people into sort of smaller pairs or smaller groups. Yeah, for me, um, and we'll get into this, David will get into this, there's this notion that when we think about facilitation, it's not just in that moment. Facilitation starts before the actual event and after. And so when we think about that, if you have a group and we're doing something, um we might ask ourselves have we commuted have we communicated the the, the the purpose of this event what is the outcome that we're looking for did we give them like david was saying did we give the introverts the things that they need the extroverts the things that they need are we creating that safe space and so one of the things that you might often see is oh we had a really fun icebreaker then we actually get to the meet and everybody's quiet and a lot of that that the times that that happens is because there was no connection to the actual thing that we were working on. There was no, um, it wasn't really purposefully stated. So there's ways and techniques that you would start to think about that. And then the different techniques like the liberating structure one to four all of how to make sure everybody's um, voice is heard. But I think the principles and, and making sure that we, we think about that um, when we fall back on how we're facilitating is important and also the other thing to think about for me that I've encountered are, is, are the right people in the room? 
Um, so when we think about stakeholders, are those the right stakeholders or not? Maybe they're not saying anything because it's not their decision to contribute to. Um, so those are the things that I think about. Mm. I'd also add as well, silence isn't always necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and we do talk about this in some of our scrum.org uh, classes. Um, as a facilitator, it can feel uncomfortable and the temptation is to step in and fill that silence. But sometimes you just got to give some space and, you know, ask that open question, ask that powerful question and just step back as a facilitator and let the silence hang a little bit. And uh, again, giving space for someone from the group to start to, to fill in. The danger is, again, as a facilitator, you feel like you have to step in and fill the silence because of the discomfort. So part of what we're saying here is acknowledging that discomfort is kind of natural and just part of what we experience uh, sometimes in, in group dynamics. Great, okay, thank so you. So this takes us on to um, the model that we're going to talk about from the Sam Kainer book, which uh, could be a useful way of thinking about this. So if we uh, go on to the next slide, please, Patricia. Uh, so in the Sam Kainer book uh, that uh, Patricia mentioned earlier, the facilitator's guide to participatory decision making, there's a model that I certainly found useful once uh, I read about this, and it's called the diamond of participatory decision making. So what Sam Kane is acknowledging here that this discomfort, discomfort that we're talking about in group dynamics, when we're dealing with complex questions or complex problems, it's natural. We shouldn't feel bad. We shouldn't feel that our team is dysfunctional if we are observing this or if we're experiencing this. Again, going back to just group dynamics in general, um, it, it's normal for when we've got a whole group of different people, different backgrounds, different experiences, it's going to sometimes be a struggle for everybody to make sense of the wide range of different perspectives that we've got. And we can experience this as, uh, as being unpleasant. Uh, it could be that some team members are having to repeat themselves and they're getting frustrated because they're not feeling that they're being understood. Uh, it could feel like uh, maybe my idea is being attacked. So maybe I get defensive. Uh, maybe I get short tempered because, again, my idea is uh, not being uh, understood or taken forward. And some other people might just be disengaging. Um, so, like I say, all of these things that we're seeing are perfectly natural um, when, 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 we're, when we're dealing with complex uh, problems in groups. In fact, you could say that these things are actually a positive. We could be at the tipping point now where the team is starting to get creative. They're starting to tap into their creative juices. So Sam Kainer, he, he called this period uh, the groan zone. This is the period where the group of people, they've kind of gone past the the easy options and they're getting to, into the more in-depth conversations they're starting to challenge each other they're starting to uh, think about the problem being presented in a deeper way they're starting to think of different options and they're starting to challenge each other so this is this period of uh, discomforts that sam kane calls the the growing zone so the temptation, as we say, is for us to try to shut down the conversations at this point. However, we, we, we've, we've then closed the door to creativity. You know, we've got to acknowledge that sometimes individuals need time to express their ideas, to form their ideas, to think about their opinions, and they need time to, and help to understand what others are saying and thinking. So it's about creating that space for good communication. So as we say, the worst thing that we can do as a facilitator is shut the conversation down at this point because of the feeling of discomfort. And what we're saying is good facilitation is how can we embrace this discomfort but use it to our advantage? How can we start to navigate the grown zone so that we get to a shared understanding and really powerful outcomes where everybody is aligned on the final decision that's being made? And this is where good facilitation comes in. How do we navigate this grown zone? So we, this, this is not a question of just using willpower or just trying to power on. Uh, we've got to be smart. We've got to use some uh, good effective facilitation techniques, uh, techniques that are embody the facilitation principles. So let's have a look at those. So 
we talk about the facilitation principles, and this is something that we uh, uh, discuss on the PSF course, PSFS. And these are participatory, healthy, transparency, process, and uh, purposeful. Uh, so we'll go through these uh, quickly. So participatory, maybe maybe the core principle, the most important one. Uh, so by being participative, what we mean is we are creating a space where everybody feels like they can contribute. Everybody is able to have a say. Everybody's ideas are um, allowed to um, come to the table. What we don't want to do is think about every making everybody speak. It's not about con contributing in that way, it's about making sure that everybody's got a fair opportunity to share their ideas and uh, create understanding. So this kind of links into healthy facilitation, creating that self sp safe space where people feel like they're not gonna be judged, they can come up with their ideas um, and conflict is okay. Um, but we talk about healthy con conflict. It's okay to disagree with ideas and opinions, but we want to keep the conversations healthy and we're avoiding conflict where it becomes personal and attack on individuals. You know, attacking on ideas is one thing, that's, that's healthy, that helps us to um, build upon the ideas, but we want to uh, keep the, the, the space safe. By transparency, again, you can start to see how there's some overlap with Scrum here. But we want to create shared understanding. Uh, and we pick our words carefully here. We talk about transparency, not visibility. So just because somebody has had their say or we've got some artifact that captures the idea, that doesn't mean that everybody has understood it. So for me, transparency only exists when we've got visibility, yes, but when people are actually understanding what the artifact is, what the idea is. So again, facilitating a way that helps create that shared understanding. Uh, process is important so that we are being guided towards some sort of objective. Uh, Patricia mentioned earlier that it's important when we're facilitating that we've got a clear objective, a clear goal in mind. So how can we use the process, the, 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 the techniques that we might employ? How can we use that to make sure that we are heading towards that uh, goal that we're looking for? So as a facilitator, we are looking for different approaches, techniques that we've got in our toolbox that um, enable the transparency, keep things safe, as we've talked about, uh, allowing everybody to participate um, in, in such a way, uh, but also being uh, able to pivot if, uh, if we're not going towards our goal. Uh, and again, kind of mentioned this already, but this is kind of wrapped up in this last uh, principle around being purposeful. What, what's the objective of what we're trying to get from, from, from a session, uh, whether it's, whether it's uh, sprint planning, whether it's um, a, a daily scrum, again, keeping that purpose of what we're, what we're meeting for. So David, thanks for sharing this. Why are there principles for facilitation? Uh, good question, Lindsay. Um, for me, I, I think it's it's relatively easy to teach and learn a facilitation technique, a practice. Right. Um, however, that just show me what the mechanics is. This is how to do it. I think for me as a facilitator, I think having principles to fall back on kind of guides me on the why, what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, it's providing guidance in, you know, if something's not working and I need to try something else, well, why not? I could be looking at the principles to guide me on, uh, uh, on, on, on the direction that I should be taking. What's not working with this particular um, technique that I'm using? Maybe I'm not getting the participation that I'm looking for, right, that's going to be the guidance. I'm going to maybe pivot and uh, look at uh, how I'm using that technique or look for a different one. So I think about these principles as the why behind some of the mechanics of some of the facilitation techniques and the guidance. Does that kind of help? Yes, it does. Cool, awesome. Um, good, okay. So let's move on. Um, talk about how do we think about using these principles uh, in terms of navigating the growing zone? How do we get through this growing zone? Uh, like I said earlier, this is more than just willpower. 
it's more than just keeping people in the meeting room uh, until they can get to a decision. Uh, the first step is as a group, as a facilitator, acknowledging that the growing zone exists. Uh, as we go into this session, as we go into our discussions, acknowledging that we could have some difficult um, conversations. This could get difficult and it's okay, that's fine. Um, just acknowledging that the growing zone exists um, and kind of setting the theme and setting expectations help teams to, I suppose, um, soften the blow when it comes along. The other thing that we can do is use techniques that help us to build empathy with each other, uh, techniques that allow us to uh, enable active listening. Um, for example, I can think of a technique like the white elephants, where, for example, maybe a, maybe a product owner needs some help ordering a product backlog, and we can use a white elephant technique uh, or a, a technique like the white elephant, where basically a stakeholder can place an item on the product backlog somewhere. They can, they, can, they can decide where they want a particular item in the ordering. Um, the trick with that one is only the person that is placing the item gets to speak. And the rest of the stakeholders and the product owner observing, uh, they, just, they just listen. Uh, so techniques that kind of, um, kind of uh, encourage just one speaker at a time. Um, another example is uh, I've seen some scrum teams in their daily scrum have a, a talking object. Only the person with the objects um, is able to speak and the rest of the team um, are, are practicing active listening, for example. Uh, there are other techniques that, again, allow everybody's idea to surface. We mentioned one, two, four, all um, from liberating structures earlier. There's lots of other techniques out there that gives everybody a chance, not just to speak, but for their idea to come forward. And it's not so much about the, the, the person speaking or not. It's about has their great idea had an opportunity to grow? So uh, one, two, four, for example, giving everybody a little bit of time, space, to think about how they would answer a question or come up with an idea for a particular problem, and then discussing in pairs, building upon each other's ideas, and then uh, coming back to groups, so building on top of each other. So hopefully using techniques like that allow the good ideas to, uh, to, to come up. So again, it's about employing the right technique um, for the group to, to, to allow the, the participation, um, the the, 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 the healthy conflict resolution and making things transparent to try to get to that shared understanding. Uh, I think another important point is making sure that we've got um, good decision rules in place, that we're upfront around how decisions are actually going to be made. What is meant by decision rules? Um, okay, so decision rules is... Um, and okay, so, maybe some examples. So, for example, uh, we, we might use a technique to generate a lot of ideas, uh, maybe we want to generate lots of um, ideas for a solution on how to implement a particular product backlog item, for example. Um, how are we going to decide which is the best one? We might employ a technique like dot voting or maybe a fist of five where everybody in the team holds up their fists and how much they agree with an idea, they would hold up five fingers if they fully agree with it. If they don't agree, maybe it's just one finger. But all right, maybe maybe we've got a majority of people that hold up uh, three or above fingers. Does that mean that we're going to carry the idea forward? Uh, we kind of need to have these conversations up front and say, this is how we're going to decide on something. Do we need unanim unanimity? Um, maybe the decision that we're making is so important that we need everybody in the team to agree to it. Um, it could be like something. Um, really fundamental around how the team works. Maybe there's a, there's, there's a new um, work, change to the working agreement, or maybe something in the definition of done, which is going to be really key. We might agree that this is so critical, we need every member of the team to buy into it. So in that case, we're going to discuss it, we're going to do a fist to five, and we want to see fives across the board. Um, yeah. Or maybe we would say uh, majority, uh, we can just do a democratic um, vote and the majority. Uh, if we get a majority agreement, then the uh, then the motion carries. For example, yeah, the, um, it makes me think of a couple of things. So management 3.0, delegation, poker, um, and it might be, hey, this person, we agree that upfront, this person's going to make the decision. We think about the accountabilities in Scrum, um, but 
let that person have information um, and different um, different evidence before they make the decision. It could be something like the sprint retrospective. Dot voting would be great if you say, hey, we'll take the top three items. That's what the team agrees to. So dot voting would be um, applicable there. So there's there's a lot of different ways, but the, the important thing there is just about being upfront and out aware of how the decision is going to be to be made because that's the problem when you have the grown zone. You have a lot of ideas. You're trying to get through the the the, the conflict, the healthy conflict, and then you're going to have less options, and then the decision has to be made, and we have to know how that decision will be made, and and that'll change for different circumstances. Yeah, and I. I... Uh, another example where you've kind of got a decision rule built into the Scrum framework with the product owner being ultimately accountable for the product backlog ordering. So the product owner might employ techniques like uh, the white elephant that I mentioned. They might use something like buy a feature, a technique to get stakeholders feedback on on the ordering of the product backlog, but ultimately it's the product owner's um, decision. So uh, there's an example where you've got um, a decision all sort of built in uh, to the Scrum framework itself. Are there techniques that you like, especially for remote working? We have a couple questions that came in on that topic. Yeah, I, I haven't found any, with some creativity, I haven't found any technique that I've not been able to employ remotely. Um, so for example, for the one, two, four, all, uh, you, you need the right tooling, of course, but uh, we're using Zoom today. So Zoom has breakout rooms. So I facilitated one, two, four, alls online where I'd put people um, into breakout rooms in pairs, start the time for the, for the couple of minutes where they have their discussion, bring them back, then put the pairs into their groups of four, for example. So it can be a bit fiddly, but it's, it's possible. Uh, and using good whiteboarding tools such as Mural or Miro, uh, lots of uh, good uh, tools. And the tooling is getting better all the time. Uh, so I think it's just understanding the technique and then thinking about how can I make this work virtually? And I've not really discovered any, which I've not really been able to recreate uh, virtually. Um, I don't know about you there, uh, Patricia, have you uh, got uh, any mean, that you've not been able to do? No, I mean, well, we had to dive into it during the pandemic. I think the the, everything's gotten better. As a matter of fact, there's more ways to do things when you want to have an anonymous sort of environment when we're making uh, suggestions or voting and, and things like that on a mural. Um, breakout rooms, ha having conversations. Um, I mean, sometimes in the same way that physically you would have to prepare for something, you would, you would probably set up your space um, beforehand. And um, I think for me, the most difficult thing is probably when there's a hybrid so the the hybrid of some people are remote and some people are not um and then and then the conversation that leads up is when are we remote and when are we not for me when we think about the hybrid situation i like to serve at the um i would just the the lowest affinity of, of you know if, if we're all if some people are remote and we're trying to share information let's let's serve the people who are remote um and and that really makes things a little bit more collaborative. That makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, again, just to reemphasize, acknowledging that the green zone exists and being armed with lots of, uh, or being familiar with lots of different facilitation techniques, uh, but not just knowing the techniques, but the why behind them. Um, uh, and again, encouraging that uh, active listening and um, dialogue that allows everybody to uh, participate. So if we move on, um, if we think about what this means for Scrum teams and why this is important. We often talk about collaboration uh, in Scrum teams, um, but often we don't really talk about what this really means. Uh, and I like this line that we kind of pulled from the PSFS uh, class. We talk about without shared understanding, meaningful collaboration is meaningless. Teams that can tolerate the stress of the growing zone are more likely to build that shared understanding, which is a precondition for innovative collaboration. And I think this is a great little line to think about. Um, if we are going to be creative, or we are, if we are going to be innovative, if we're going to solve complex problems, we need 
We need to do so with groups of people, but groups of people that are collaborating. But for collaboration to come to life, they need to understand each other, understand the problem they're trying to solve and understand diff the different options that their teammates are offering up. This is how we get to collaborative teams through that shared understanding and using the right facilitation techniques to get us there. Yeah, I think there's a lot. There's several little lines in here for me. The, the notion for me that's very important is that without conflict, you don't build trust. And so when we have healthy conflict or a healthy disagreement, um, that is what allows us to, to continue to collaborate. And we already have all the politics and drama that exists in an organization. Um, so this, 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 this box that we can help facilitate to um, create a space where it's, it's okay to have different, different ideas and that we're gonna get through them and that things are a little bit more transparent and visible is, is important for me. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So there's lots we can do um, around thinking about how do we enable better facilitation? How do we get better facilitation skills uh, as a scrum team? And this is not just something for the scrum master, that this is something the whole team should be thinking about. Um, if we think about the product owner, maybe facilitating a stakeholder review, they might be running the, the sprint review, for example. Um, developers in a scrum team, they, they might be facilitating um, a, a, a demonstration of the products uh, to some stakeholders outside of the sprint review. So this is a skill that the whole team um, can develop. And we are looking at moving beyond the skills on the left to some of the skills on the right. So you know, being disciplined around time, sticking to time boxes, really great skill. But taking to that next level, we're, we're looking at how do we how do we ensure that within that time box that we've got a clear objective and we are focused on meeting that objective. Moving from not just encouraging everybody to contribute, but making sure that all the ideas that are possible are explored uh, and, and understood as much as possible. Um, Having an agenda, following it, making sure that we are, again, keeping to our time box, trying to keep to the goal is important. Uh, but yeah, focusing on really making sure that we are meeting the objective of the group discussion that we're looking to facilitate. Rather than uh, halting arguments, stopping conflict, we're looking at resolving conflict. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, Patricia, isn't, isn't, isn't this the same thing? Isn't calling a halt to argument? Isn't isn't this conflict management? <laughs> you mean when I tell someone to shut up? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, calling a halt to an argument, if someone thinks of that as, oh, we're not having conflict, that's just that's that's stopping the conflict from emerging. And if we're thinking about this notion, especially for a scrum master as a change agent, that's that's kind of putting a, an impediment right there. So resolving conflict really goes back to, I think what I was talking about before, allowing it to happen and knowing that we'll be okay when it happens and we can do it again, that's resolving conflict. We've gone through it, there's an understanding and we can, we can, we can move forward. And that really, you know, when you're talking about these things on the left, moving to the right, it's really about developing the skill. And when we're resolving the conflict and what we can learn is, specifically what type of techniques can we use to pull out these conversations um, as we move to the left and right. But yeah, I think it's more than just telling people to can it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, completely agree. Um, yeah, I think a certain level of conflict is, is good and that's what we're looking for because it means people are challenging each other's ideas uh, and that allows us to build upon them and hopefully get to the best possible solutions. Um, so yeah, moving away from just having consent and moving towards consensus, a little bit like we just spoke about earlier. Um, moving away from thinking about facilitation as keeping everybody entertained, making sure everybody has fun and enjoys the session to actually thinking about techniques that are relevant for where the team is and navigating through the growth zone to get to those strong outcomes that we're looking for. So uh, these are the sorts of uh, skills that uh, we, uh, we, we're looking at help to um, uh, develop uh, for strong facilitation. We have a question that came in specific to time boxes. How do you plan time boxes according to the topic and decision to take? Um, yeah, well, how? Well, so what's great is that in the Scrum framework, there, there, there are suggestions for how we should think about the, the time boxes. If right. they, 
the, the question is, you know, we have a suggested time box. Let's just use the daily scrum and it's, it's, it's 15 minutes. Um, what, what we would say is, okay, we have 15 minutes and we should get clearer around, this is what we need to address. This is creating a clear objective to be met. This is making sure that that objective is met um, and trying to, to think about that and the goal rather than also the other one is, you know, so we don't have to, maybe it's 16 minutes, maybe it's 20 minutes, maybe it's eight minutes. But the thing that tends to happen during daily scrums is you see that everybody starts talking about everything and we start working on the problem, your clear objective is not being met. So it's kind of framing it um, there. And, and that's just one, one example, I think in a brainstorming session, usually we, you just, you kind of use the time box to set it. That's what I do. I'll think, okay, let's let's cap this at 45 minutes and see if we need another one. But always thinking about how are we being clear and also as as David said, the participatory, how are we making sure that the voices are being heard? And so sometimes that means there's a little bit of pre-work. We might have some of those suggestions so that we can come to those sessions um, and have a working session. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think the most important part there is having that clear objective of what we're trying to get from the session and just bringing people back to that, maybe just as a facilitator, just ask the question, is this conversation contributing to the goal of the session? Um, and I think it's important to remember why we've got time boxes in the first place as well. So again, we're trying to create that focus on answering that particular question or the goal of that um, uh, event. Um, Again, you can like a technique like one, two, four, all. You're very constrained by time, but that kind of forces the good sort of ideas to kind of come out because you're, 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 we, we're stopping from going down too many rabbit holes. All right, thank you. I think the other painful part of that is when someone says, oh, time box is over, we've got to stop. Mm. Um, and someone's in the middle of sharing a great idea. So just you know, being aware of those things too as a facilitator, which is for me why those principles um, are important and to be able to fall back on what we're trying to do um, rather than here, here's, here's what we're exactly going to do as a facilitator. And that's why for me, I think this, is, this slide is nice where it's called developing facilitation skills. It's really taking it to the next level. Yeah, yeah. Um, always interesting when the uh, conversation that Patricia and I had was the difference between consent and consensus. So um, I think it's important to maybe talk about that. Um, Patricia, how did, how did you uh, kind of uh, um, interpret uh, the difference between consent and consensus, Patricia? Yeah, so this, this has come up a lot in some of the classes too. So uh, when we're thinking about just establishing consent to consensus, this is moving for me toward the grown zone. So establishing consent is you know, everyone says yes, or everyone says no, or, you know, people are silent or not sure, versus consensus is we are all aware and we agree with the direction that's going and participated in that conversation. So it's, it's not, um, it's not really necessarily everybody saying our yes or no based off of our decision rule, but there's an understanding of how we're going to make this decision and we've had participation in that. This is, this is important when I think about things at scale. So this is, you know, everybody's had their voice. Everybody's contributed a little bit, um, or not a little bit, but everybody's contributed to, to the notion of, of how we're going to move forward. And that for me is, is about building consensus versus establishing just yes or no. Mm. So it's taking that string and pulling it further. What about you? Yeah, it's, it's certainly one that we've talked a lot. Of, um, it feels like we've talked a lot of, over the last few weeks, isn't it? Um, yeah, for me, it goes back to what we were talking about uh, earlier in the session, where consent might mean that people are kind of moving forward, but they don't really f fully agree with the proposal, uh, the decision that's been made. They're kind of just going along with it. I consent to uh, go along, go with the flow. Consensus, I think, is something more powerful where people have got more buy-in. Uh, they, they actually feel like they are, have bought into the sort of proposal. So we've kind of gone that one, one step further. So I like what you say there about pulling that string a little bit further. Because um, again, hopefully that leads to more people 
that's uh, more motivated to, uh, to and more committed to um, uh, to what's being done. I think that's it. The, the the commitment and the accountability and the I feel I feel committed to this decision and how we're going to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw uh, something in the uh, chat. Consent is to sit in the rowboat. Consensus is to contribute to the rowing. <laughs> so uh, thank you to Kylie uh, thank for that. Thank you for that example. <laughs> we won't be borrowing it uh, a lot. Um, one of the one of the things for me, just for people to know that when we thought about you know developing skills, and there's there's on Scrum.org facilitation, you'll see a lot of uh, definition around this stuff, um, the principles, etc. But for me. Um, the last one, introducing fun activities versus actually applying techniques to navigate something that exists for us every day in teams, the grown zone, is, 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 is a little bit at the crux of why we're pursuing skills and developing people in teams and, and something like facilitation that can help a lot because a lot of people think, oh, there's a lot of conflict, but uh, with better facilitation, we could actually kind of hit, uh, hone in on what that, that conflict is. And so there are great techniques out there. Obviously, everybody loves liberating structures. There's all different techniques that aren't liberating structures that are also really helpful for facilitation. Like, let's take five minutes and pause. That's a facilitation technique. But what happens, what I see is that a lot of people will just throw um, some sort of liberating structure or facilitation, which is not applicable sometimes in a scrum team without, without uh, manipulation. Um, but the, what happens is, is that this, this progress, this, this thing like navigating a burn zone gets lost. And you're obviously, when you're dealing with smart people um, and creative people, you only get so many chances at that. So when you go, oh, this was fun, but they don't see the purpose behind it. They're not gonna be uh, ready to participate the next time. They're not gonna be ready to speak up. And so, so just developing it and thinking about where you can move with facilitation as a skill and. Not that it's not about fun, but it's really about collaboration is, is very interesting uh, to me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we're handing back to Lindsay at this point. Okay, so we have limited time for questions. We did, we did, we were able to get some of them throughout. Um, so I'm going to ask you both a few of these. So this question came in earlier in the session. How can Scrum Masters help teams that are not self-organizing, especially when it's feeling like instructional and directional events? OK. Um, I think for this one, it, it, again, not knowing the specifics of what's behind the question, kind of only give a sort of general opinion i think right. when we talk to, when we talk about self-organizing it's always um i always think about self-organization means self-organization within boundaries what are the boundaries that we're setting as a, as a leader and, and i look at the scrum master as the leader of of running scrum right so just putting a group of people in the room and say self-organize that's that's not really good facilitation that's not what we're looking for so again it goes back to some of the things that we talked about making it clear yes you're going to self-organize but within boundaries one of the boundaries is we we need to come to this outcome so for example i look at the daily scrum uh, we've got to make it clear that the boundaries are that we've got an outcome that we, that we need to achieve, which is the team has got a shared understanding on how they're going to work together for the next 24 hours. Uh, we've got a clear um, inspection and adaptation opportunity where the Scrum team, the developers, should be inspecting their sprint backlog and making adjustments. That's what we're expecting from the, uh, from the daily Scrum how the developers choose to self-organize or self-manage within those constraints that's up to the team but as a if i'm facilitating that as a scrum master or if i'm leading that team as a scrum master that's how i'd kind of frame it great then if thank that you. helps thank you this next question how are you managing the problem of limited time and time pressure versus giving enough time for managing the grown zone? Uh, yeah, tricky one again. Um, it's, there's always this balance. Um, and if we go back to the previous slide, 
Uh, we're not saying that time boxing isn't important. Again, this is a this is a very important skill. Uh, so keeping people on track, going back to what we've talked about in terms of making sure that there's a clear objective that we're trying to achieve. Um, and like I say, some of these um, facilitation techniques are designed to bring out people's ideas in a, an efficient and a, a effective way. Um, and hopefully allowing the good ideas to sort of uh, bubble to the surface. So again, for me, it's about that combination of having this clear objective that we're trying to achieve. And maybe if maybe if we feel like we're running out of time, maybe that objective is too big. Uh, maybe that needs to be broken down into uh, into, into, into smaller, um, less complicated ones. Um, I put, I put this back up. So when we're thinking about the grown zone, the grown zone is not just a bunch of people fighting each other. It's this notion that we have a group of people that are going, we're, we're trying to come up with a better idea uh, with us. So we're, we're trying to get out our, our ideas rapidly. Um, that's usually some where one, two, four, all will work well. It's when we have to start to make that decision and understand of how we're going to move forward. So when we get out a bunch of ideas, that's great. And then we start to refine that um, and somebody will feel hurt because you know people didn't vote on their idea or something. And it's, it's, it's being upfront with that and then how we're going to make the decision will really happen. So we're not trying to minimize the grown zone. Um, we're not trying to rush people through it, but if we allow it to happen, it will get more comfortable next time and we'll understand it more next time. So depending on the scope of what you're talking about, at least, you know, letting it happen a few times um, in a way that with just that really focus on this, is, this sounds like, you know, we're at a disagreement, but allowing it to happen will make it easier the next time that those feelings of being uncomfortable. And it comes back to what we talked about earlier with making the decision rules really upfront. So it's almost like the working agreement, if we want to make that clear. So here's the objective, here's how we're going to do it. Here's our time box. Here's the technique that we're going to use. We need to get to, we need to try to get to consensus within this time. Um, so it's, it's 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 striking that balance to allow, like I say, everybody to have their say. But as Patricia says, it's not about people arguing. It's about using that process so that people feel like they've had their say, and everybody is at least felt understood. Great, thank you. So we are coming up at the end of our time box and I wanna be respectful of everybody's busy days here. So I am going to drop a link to an upcoming webinar that we have next week. It's going to be a live Q and A session on this topic. David will be there and so will professional scrum trainer, Simon Flossman and Patricia will be there to moderate. So I'm dropping that link in here now. Hope to see many of you there. And you can bring your questions. We're also going to share our questions today with David and Patricia so that they can address these with you as well. And I also want to drop a link in case you are curious about the new PSFS training course. So there's some information about that there. And thank you so much, Patricia and David. How can the audience best get in touch with you? Uh, for me, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, David Spinks. Um, I don't look too dissimilar to my LinkedIn profile picture, so you can find me there. Um, or you can look at my uh, company, Red Tangerine, so uh, you can find our web website there. What a funny thing to call out. Um, so for me, it's obviously also on LinkedIn, um, Kong KONG, and then um, I'd encourage people actually to look at, um, I was looking at some of the questions that we didn't get to answer. There's there might be a little bit of assistance and guidance on the Scrum.org website. Um, we have a lot of prolific information. So look up under facilitation, look up, look at the videos of how to facilitate, how to use this technique, um, and, and let us know what you think of that and if that's helpful or not. Um, but yeah, if you have questions, all the hard ones should go to David and <laughs> all, the, all the easy ones can go to Lindsay. <laughs> All right, so, and I did drop links to those resources that Trish had mentioned as well. So thank you everybody for joining today and we hope to see you all again on, an, on another session. Scrum on. <laughs>